Holly Martin. I am currently a high school Spanish teacher in Denver, Colorado. I grew up in Illinois, studied Spanish education, so it's K-12 in the state of Illinois. I studied abroad in Spain for a semester while I was in college, and then when I graduated college, decided to teach abroad. After teaching abroad, was back in Illinois, worked as a school district translator for a while, um, taught in a middle school for a dual language program there, doing social studies and heritage language um, with Spanish, and also some ESL. You are interested in the ELL options. It's a fast-growing career path, and there's a high need um, in much of the United States these days. Um, so it's a great thing to look into. Went back to Chile after I had a year there as a volunteer, and then I was a substitute teacher for a while and did some random jobs before um, landing out here in Colorado. When I was in high school, I started learning Spanish. There weren't a lot of opportunities to practice what I had learned, but I was just so fascinated in all of the cultures, especially Latino and Spanish-speaking cultures. I knew for sure that what I wanted to do was continue learning Spanish and practicing it. So as the first person in my family to go to a four-year university, declaring my major as Spanish, I knew that I wanted to follow a career path that would allow me to communicate with people and to help my community wherever that would be. Being in a small community that was not super diverse, there was, I thought that that would help to increase tolerance and acceptance of other people and to really expose them to this new culture and idea. Um, apart from that, it's also really good for your brain. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that learning another language is really exercising another part of your brain that helps you in delaying things like Alzheimer's, for instance. Since I had studied abroad in Spain, I wanted to teach abroad in a different country. In a Spanish-speaking country, though, since that was the language I had studied, but I would teach English, of course. If you're teaching abroad, it's easier to travel whatever continent you go to. You can travel around that continent with a lot more ease. Networking, if you're there in another country, you're getting to know other people. Those are friendships and professional relationships that you can keep with you for your entire life. If you decide to teach English, for instance, in another country that does not have English as their national language, it's great for language immersion. If you are putting yourself in a day-to-day -day, uh, situation and environment where you have to use that other language, you are going to learn that language. Personal growth, definitely. I would say determine what your goals are. What do you want to get out of your experience? I determined that the country that I wanted to go to was Chile. I looked at safety of the country, to be honest, and access to different forms of technology and things like that. I found a program through their Ministry of Education um, that had the different things that I was looking to get out of the experience. So for me, that was a great choice. I would suggest really making sure you know, like, if it's a program you want to go through, what opportunities do they have? What types of supports do they offer for their volunteers? Do you want to be paid for it? Do you want it to be more like a job? Or do you want it to be a volunteering position where you're placed with a host family or something like that? Um, also look and see what the different requirements are for the program if you qualify. Most programs require you to apply for them as though you're applying for a job. I included several helpful resources, either I have used or friends, colleagues have used in looking up reviews and different experiences of people to aid them in finding a program. Different countries have different requirements, not just the programs themselves, but the country, you know, has different visa requirements. And so also, depending on what country you are coming from, the different countries maybe have different fees and things like that. If possible, contact past or current participants in the program as well to really get a lot of, like, inside information about it 
I would also say look into different certificates if it's necessary to get them before going. If you're going to teach English abroad, TEFL, sometimes it's called TESOL. Um, there are different acronyms for it, but it's like teaching English as a foreign language, essentially. Most countries accept those. And so sometimes just having one kind of on hand and on your resume kind of gives you that stepping stone to get to a lot of other places. A lot of times you need um, a letter to prove what it is you're going to be doing in that country, things like that. To find different vaccine recommendations, you can talk to your doctors about it. Also, though, you can go to um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website. It's a government website. If there's malaria or yellow fever, for instance, things like that common in the other country, what vaccines um, they recommend. Um, that's the cdc.gov slash travel is a great resource for that. Um, also, if you're interested in knowing like safety, are there like travel bans on certain places? It's travel.state.gov. Um, decide, do you want to live with the host family? Do you want to live in like international dorms? Do you want to find your own place? What does that look like? Do you need to contact somebody to help you before you get there? Can you stay in a hostel and look for places from there? Decide also, do you want to live in a city, a small town? What is the travel going to look like there? Do you need to be in a big city where you can walk to and from the school that you're at, for instance? If there are medications that you take on a regular basis, talk to your doctor as well, but determine if that's a medication that you can get in the other country. If it's something that you need to like get a you know, more of your prescriptions, like right up front and take them all with you. If it's something that you can get while you're there, if that means you need to get a prescription from a doctor in that country, look into that if that is something that really pertains to you. Um, similarly, if you have diet restrictions, look into that. Some countries you know, have a certain lifestyle. And if that isn't something that really fits into what you believe in or your lifestyle, that could really play a huge impact as well. So a little bit about my specific program that I did in Chile. It's called English Open Doors or Inglés Abre Puertas. It is through their Ministry of Education. They have a budget that allots it to this program. So the requirements for this program are that you're native or near native English speaker. For instance, one of my good friends that I met there is actually from Austria. Her first language is German, but she's near native in English as well since she learned it since she was a child. So she was able to do it as well. For this program, you had to be 21 or older, and also you had to have a bachelor's degree. It did not matter what your bachelor's degree was in, however. You just had to have one. You did not have to have a teaching certificate or anything like that. You could live with the host family or independently. So you could decide which route was best for you. You got a stipend for living expenses, a little bit less if you lived with the host family because the government gave the host family enough money basically to cover like your, your meals for the day, that sort of thing. If you decided to live on your own, you were given more because you would have to be responsible for your bills. For this program, something that was great is that the visa fees were covered. This is a huge deal because... Currently, to get a visa in Chile, I believe it's $500. Different training we got was that we had a week-long orientation in Santiago, which is the capital of Chile. So you got to meet everybody and network, all of that. But the cool thing about this program is for that week, we had classes that were TESOL classes. So we were taught how to teach students um, a different language, how to really give clear instruction, and to teach in all English when that was not their native language. Some of the challenges I found pertain to me when I studied abroad as well as when I taught abroad in Chile is transportation. At one point, I lived in a small town in Chile, and transportation was more of an issue. It was less frequent. You had to walk places. The bus system is good in Chile um, to get from one city to another, but within the city itself, that was more of a difficulty. There were taxis and things like that, something called colectivos, which is like Uber. They have an Uber pool, 
ride sharing essentially something that you know as a woman in another country is machismo that's um this idea where kind of like the patriarchy you know so um a lot of like cat calling things like that that are just accepted that can be a difficulty there are just are different structures and priorities in their education system I think that can be true in any country, not just in Chile or South America. It was something that I found very interesting, though, having a background in education and having had experience teaching in the United States, being able to compare it to what the education system is like in Chile was very interesting to me. At first, it was really hard to recognize that uh, there would just be random assemblies that we would find out about like 20 minutes before they were going to happen. And it was like, oh, I guess class is canceled and I can't do anything about it. If it was like a national soccer game, just no one would show up to class. Or sometimes they would just like the entire school would watch games together if it was a championship. Learn to go with the flow, essentially. But be persistent because I think it is easy to just kind of get discouraged sometimes when it doesn't happen as quickly as maybe we're used to just getting things done. Go, go, go. Things are not always that, you know, rushed around in other places. Um, Don't take things personally. That goes with any cultural experience. Probably any of the Spanish-speaking countries I have been to. I can't speak for all of them, but the ones I have been to. um, A friend or someone could say like, oh, you've really gained weight. That's something that to us in the United States or, you know, in other cultures as well, would be seen as offensive. Like, you wouldn't believe that somebody would tell that to your face, but to them, it's not meant to be offensive. It's almost seen as a good thing because it's a way that they show you they're paying attention and that they care about you. Things like food could be a challenge depending on what your diet is, depending on where you live. If you're in a small town and it's winter... You might not be getting a lot of vegetables. It might be a lot of meat and potatoes and bread. And so preparing yourself for that and kind of figuring out creative solutions to that as well. So some of my personal experiences and takeaways, I learned how to teach English in another country and just to improve different things, especially giving clear instructions. That was one of the biggest things that I learned as a teacher to really slow down, to act things out, to teach another language completely in that language, even if the students aren't native in it. Feeling like I was able to be a part of the community in another place. I became more proficient in my own Spanish skills. You are making a difference in another place. I think I became much more adaptable and flexible, which helps me even here. Anytime you go to another country, you end up learning a lot more about your own country and culture just by having those shared experiences with other people. For me and for a lot of people I know, it is very different. And I think until you experience it, it's hard to believe that they are so different. When I studied abroad um, in college, it felt much more like it was catered to me, so to speak, that there was a program that I followed the set steps in place, that they had planned social um, events for me. Whereas when you go to teach abroad, you're much more independent and you're kind of just on your own to figure things out. You have to take the lead in trying to become part of the community. It's not like you are just automatically accepted necessarily. That was a huge difference for me. On the plus side with that, I really did feel like I was part of the community when I taught abroad. When I studied abroad, I felt like a visitor. Um, Up here is just like a soccer field. Um, The first time I lived in Chile, I was in a small town in the south. It was a very poor community, but there was a lot of community pride. We would go to school soccer games It was just this great way to see the students involved outside of school and to build that sense of community. Up here is myself with one of my good friends. Um, The second time I lived in Chile, we traveled to Patagonia, um, just backpacked around, and it was a great experience because she is also a teacher, but she's Chilean. We would go and just talk to the locals, and we learned so much about the history of the country and just different cultural things. Traveling with someone who is native to that country offers a completely different experience than traveling yourself or traveling with other tourists. 
because you're really able to connect more to certain things. Down here is a picture of the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. Just to give you an idea of the landscapes, Chile I really consider like my second home. There's deserts, um, mountains, volcanoes, like literally every type of landscape imaginable within this country. Over here is a picture of Valparaiso, or Valpo for short. It's just, you know, large, very like eclectic city with a lot of graffiti and street art and just colors and it's on the coast so it's a really cool place to go. These are more of my experiences with the kids. Up here is just one of the classes that I worked with when I volunteered in the small town that I lived in. This was a freshman class at the time. You'll note that they all have school uniforms um, and every school has a different uniform which is a thing that they do in Chile. Um, over here was a different school I worked in as a volunteer um, in a high school. And this was like a club and extracurricular that we did. So they were pretty advanced in English at that point. And it was really cool to push them and to see what types of things that they could do. We'd play a lot of games and stuff. Down here, I have a picture of when I went back to Chile and found a job just working not in a program. It was a completely different experience because I really was on my own where you had to get really close to one class in particular and really get to know their parents and everything. So this is the picture of my like homeroom advisory type class. And I'm in the middle and was often mistaken as a student. So that was funny. Um, and then over here was an English camp I did with the program I volunteered at, um, English Abre Puertas. And so this is cool because students um, who really wanted to practice their English could apply for this camp that the government ran and it was over the summer for a week um, and they came from all over the different regions of Chile and so that was just so cool to get to do that with the different kids. Here's a picture of my host families that I lived with in Chile. I had two different host families. This was my first host family. Lived with her, Ariela, and then her daughters and granddaughter um, for a while, and it was just an incredible experience, and I really do consider her like another mother. This was my second host family. Both families I love dearly and talk to all the time, and it was cool just to get different experiences. This was more of a small town. This was a bigger city. For anyone who is interested, I have my personal and my school email there. You can look me up on Facebook as well if you want to see like more travel photos, for instance, but feel free to contact me on any of those modes. Uh, thank you again for your time and your insights. Thank you to all of our viewers. You can also register for any upcoming Enlightening Talks sessions from our Enlightening Talks webpage, which is csuglobal.edu slash enlightening dash talks. On behalf of everyone at Colorado State University Global Campus, thank you and goodbye.